Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, May 3rd, 2024. S&P 500 currently sitting at 51.17. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with NIL expert Ian McMillan. Where should we start with this episode? Yeah, 51.17. Pretty decent range for stocks this week. But although still inside yeah. the range from two weeks ago. So decent recovery yeah, this we're week. Still, we're you know, at one point, Wednesday afternoon, things looking a little... A little dicey, but we have since recovered all of that on all the major indices. The depth of the drawdown for S&P 500 was just south of 6%, so like 5.8, 5.9%. We've rebounded from that level. We're currently 2.7% off the highs. This is that unique process of market auctioning and price discovery and really near-term volatility which any trend follower would tell you can't be eliminated from markets, right? A technician will acknowledge that markets have volatility. There's no such thing as eliminating volatility. There's no such thing as a straight line in markets. And we've covered ad nauseum in the past few episodes that minus 5% corrections, we have multiples of those during a year. There's typically one minus 10% correction a year. We could still see that. Like Ian's not here saying we rebounded and it's all over. We could still correct into the rest of May, be down minus 8 or 10% off the highs, but that would be perfectly normal. And we have to keep in context, as Ian is very good at pointing out, we have a rising 200-day. We're not that many months removed from these major breath thrusts that we saw. And you look out 6, 12, 18 months from those numbers. We're just in a normal volatility period. And it's kind of like when you're taking off in an airplane and you have that little bit of volatility, some people get a little nervous. And then those who are experienced right, flyers. The first, are like, yeah, is the I mean, first I correction in a long time. You know, that's six months, but in, in market speak, that's pretty decent. And we had such a strong rally. So yeah. yeah, people get a little antsy. And then we had Jerome on Wednesday and those that like to stress. Is that a over, Jerome? Is that a hurricane? Are we in hurricane season? Yeah, stress over what the Fed does. Not a great daily candle, so we went had a nice spike and then sold off at the end of the day. So kind of adding to the wall of worry. And wouldn't you know, all four major indices, as we sit here on Friday around lunchtime, all four major indices, not only back above their Wednesday highs, but back above those late April highs. So big pops today. On, I don't know, I guess the macro people will tell you jobs data and they like to worry about jobs data is good, jobs data is bad, is what all that means. I don't know, Dave. I know stocks are higher. Yeah, I was going to say, how do we know? Back to your point earlier, what I'm very long winded point of what I'm trying to make is the surprise to the upside today. And when we talk, we've got an upward slipping 200 day. You can't be surprised with upward spikes. I mean, we are in an upward trending market. You have momentum, broad market momentum as a tailwind. You have to assume that any type of quote unquote surprise or things that the market isn't expecting, however people decide that, is going to happen to the upside. By very definition, the past 200 trading days of data when you connect them all, when you average that out, it's rising. That means demand is outpacing supply. Institutions have been buying stocks for whatever reason, whether it's farm payrolls or they were short or they believe in some future prospect of the market or an individual stock. That's just the reality. And what Ian's talking about here is when you see an airplane take off and you're observing it in the sky, Directionally speaking, you have no reason to view that it's going to go the opposite direction or start to land until you have that information. And we don't have that information yet. We don't have 
a plane that's in dissension mode ready to land. We have a market that's in ascension. It's well, and who high. wants to? I and, stay busy enough just following price. I don't need to stress over something that, oh, I think that non-farm payrolls are going to do this, and then this is how it will affect the market. I don't need the second derivative assumption of what price is going to do. I just need to worry about price. I don't know. I guess they say, the peeps say, payrolls were below expectations today. That's the word on the street. I have. Okay. Okay. I have no idea. I have no idea. I thought we were actually done with all the Fed stuff and after for- Wednesday. But of course, we got something like unemployment that they want to stress over. Yeah, I guess it was below expectations. If you're a you know literal thinking person, right? So, oh no, unemployment ticked up. That's bad for stocks. And then every index gapped a percent higher. And that is offensive to people that their opinion might not matter or that there might be 4D chess happening, and some of this is already priced in, that some really smart people are involved in this market. And so by the time that information is released, it's already priced in. Like There are so many factors, known and unknown, opinions, shrewd or otherwise, that impact price. Because in the end, what is price? It's the interaction of supply and demand. Yeah, human opinions. opinions, Whether they're made... From a brain yeah, or human opinions. from a computer, it's all human opinion. Right. And it's all meant for the prospect of gain, the prospect of avoiding loss potentially. And yet here you have this dynamic where people still want to think that one data point matters or that their own personal opinion matters. And that can be a very humbling experience. Yeah. I know very few people that like started off with technical analysis. Very few people yeah, when they were few. 20, 22, they were like, you know what? Now, newer generation, you find like a Pratty or something, okay, maybe you can find those, like that's their, they were TA from the get-go. And Pratty, if you're listening to this, stay the course. For sure. I mean, I would put David, and we've met, yeah, younger guys where they were aware of TA. My personal experience, your experience, and most people I've met, basically their journey into TA came from some type of humbling experience. Yeah, like a be that the fundamental yeah. opinion that you had, you have to be willing to acknowledge your errors and that you're wrong and that the market penalizes those who are wrong that not when they're wrong, but how long you stay. And I would say for some people that and, humbling experience can be returns For me, it was, I hated sitting in front of clients and saying things like, well, we think that the market will realize the value of this company and and, and the value of the stock over the next, you know, in the future, five, six, seven years. Like, I hated that. I Mm -hmm. wanted to make money for clients now. Not hope that because I bought some stock with a P.E. ratio of seven, um, that a bunch of other people would eventually see that I was right. Yeah, no, and and that's a very valid point. I know for me it was that the market ignored information that I felt was important. And case in point would be like 06, 2006, markets moving higher when things underneath the surface are not good. Well, it moved 30% higher. So you're telling me that we shouldn't participate in that 30% and on the flip side, acknowledge when things are moving south. And so sometimes it takes time for the market to digest information. Other times it's- Yeah, it's been digested. It's well ahead. It's it's the most- I mean, how quickly right, it's been did digested. the market tell you that COVID was going to be a nothing burger? Yeah, quickly, right? It corrected 35% and then you're like, in 26 oh, this, days. You probably then, went too far too fast. To the downside. Yeah, recovered super quick. And that's one of the interesting, being involved with markets is a blessing because not only did my family personally have information about that COVID wasn't what we thought it was, only because my wife was a nurse at the time and she was working on the front lines and it was became very apparent that this wasn't the, the one. This wasn't the one that kills one in 10. But also that yeah. the market was reflecting that. The market was showing us 
we're not gonna we're not gonna end that now right and people are gonna say well you know a lot of places still stayed shut down throughout that summer and winter and again the market is not just looking forward two to three months nine twelve eighteen months it's a future discounting mechanism and that's very hard for people to remember especially with the noise you get day-to-day headlines and they don't match day-to-day headlines about the economy or inflation or like all these things right housing prices how much eggs cost and when it, that doesn't matches, when the pain that's being felt doesn't match what's happening in the stock market, people get really frustrated by that. While we, we know the economy is doing bad, my family and my neighbors and everyone we talk to, we've all cut back on our spending. We're all getting hammered at the grocery store. We don't eat out as much. Things have just gotten so. And that's an absolute truth. It's an absolutely true. I don't think you talk to a single person in America that could say, yeah, my expenses are the same. You know, all things equal, my expenses are the same as they were two, three, four years ago. But that does not mean the stocks go down. Yeah, correct. And that time frame matters. You know, that even if we see stocks continue to correct from this point, that doesn't mean that the long term trend is not up. It just means that there are ebbs and flows to market. Market's correct. There's an auctioning process, right? Where this is called price discovery. Price discovery is where can we find equilibrium between supply and demand? It's trying to always move towards efficiency. It never gets there, but it's always trying to get there. And it's a lot like life. It's a lot like sports. There's no such thing as a perfect game, but it's trying to get there. And that's what the market is doing is looking out 6, 18, 24 months and pricing in all these variables. Some of the near-term data is noise from price volatility standpoint, and some of it is some information, but also counter trend in nature to the long-term trend, the previous 200 trading days. We've highlighted on here in the past that when we look back 200 trading days, pretty soon we're going to start dropping off data that came from August through October of last year. So you're actually going to see an acceleration mm. of the trend. And so here you're seeing a counter trend mood of, of price into an acceleration of a 200-day trend, a perfect ripe situation for a rebound into the second half of the year. I can't tell you when that happens. Like, is it, is it, is it June? I have no I idea. Know. I wish I did. I have no idea. But seasonality speaking, knowing that markets have counter trend moves, knowing the long-term trend, this is why we use technical analysis. We know all those three pieces of evidence. We know the seasonality. We know that markets have counter trend moves and we know the long-term trend. Right now we're checking those boxes and that's perfectly normal and it's okay. I can't tell you where the end of the correction is. Maybe we just had it. No idea. Maybe we have a strong summer. Typically summers are not strong. Typically May is- it's an election year, right? Election if I go back like to 2016, this. I mean, essentially flat April through, you had a right. big- over like two or three weeks in July, came back to visit that heading into election. And then, you know, we all know election night 2020. And of course, we're off to the races. And can we please not forget more recently that we moved 28% yeah. in the S&P 500 November and as, through and if you're March. Tra- you know, you're going to have to give some of that back. I wish I wasn't that the reality, but. Well, it's okay. There's an exchange being made. Again, the reason why we're involved with markets is not entertainment. It's not get rich quick. It's about protecting that purchasing power. And wouldn't you know that the narrative back in October or even further back in 2023 was, can't we just own the 5% yield on T-bills? And you would then would have missed out on the opportunity of 28%, which is still, even at current levels, 24%. So three years of returns if you had sat comfortably. So it's an interesting dynamic that we humans have is this recency bias of short-term myopic, only looking at the near-term. Now, and again, we could correct all the way back to 48.25, which would be a 38.2 retracement of the move from October through March. It'd be into a rising 200-day moving average. And do you know the squirming that would be going on? And, oh, the it's over, the bull market's over for some where people should be really backing up the truck and And it's not a recommendation. I I think that 
I mean, it's certainly just gotten worse over my career with the news cycle. And the, I mean, there's a headline for every 25 basis point move in the S&P now. We'd be a lot better going off. Yeah, I bet certainly. they made so much money back in the like Pony Express days where you got news maybe once or twice a month. That'd be way, Wouldn't yeah. That be fun? What if you got non-farm payrolls a month after they were released? They had, hey guys, they had everybody sold out. I just got a pony into Oklahoma. Yeah, I just got a pony message from my wife. Looks like I can't go out on Friday. I'm going. Yeah, out I mean, Oklahoma. it's uh, the headlines, and everyone can hop on and read a headline, and then go and make a decision in their investment account or their four hundred one k, right? And yep. When it's a new era, well, you can do it in a click of a button on an app on your phone. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to have a minimum amount, right? I still have intentions of having you and I having our fathers on here because there's an era where you had to have 2000 or 5000 well, minimum to put in a mutual fund. It had a front end load and you had to call someone to make it happen. You had to fill out all this I stuff. I told you just my dad to used to pay $100 fund. to his broker for a trade. $100. Yeah. And now I can trade in anything your pocket, I want for free you and phone. there's like an infinity more options than there were 20, 30 years ago. And now you're basing it off of CNBC and you're basing it off of some Reddit. The irony being that the same fear, greed, misinformation, shrewd opinions, non-shrewd opinions exist today. That right? And that's when our what TA is all about. It's just human behavior. I mean, if you think humans have changed over the last 500 years when it comes to money, I can tell you that you're wrong. Yeah. Get real. Yeah. Perfect example of that is like how, you know, we think back to previous dynasties or previous periods of history. We're like, oh, those people were so archaic. I can't believe they worship Zeus. Well, do you worship money? Do you yeah, worship time? I mean, do you worship comfort? Like you have your own gods. They were actually, they at least back I then mean, they were for, worshiping. They were actually probably, and again, I guess this maybe goes back to my news cycle comment. They were probably better with investing because they didn't have, they weren't they yet were living in, in a this microwave society. society of headlines and up 1% and instant gratification. How arrogant are we as people to think that somehow we're more advanced than previous generations or technologically now, we're I advanced? Can, emotionally, someone can come, emotionally, yeah, someone could be maybe like, maybe not. Yeah, emotionally, we're the same. Biases were the same. I get it. You could point out, oh, they used to bleed people. They used to use leeches. They used to like not wash their hands. I get that. I understand it. But from a, a base emotional spiritual aspect. Those people were way were better same. off for the fact we that still, they couldn't log into their Schwab brokerage account and look at the balance on a daily basis. Yeah. They were more focused on their relationships and that was healthy. And rather than trying to account for every basis point move using a non-farm payroll, whatever that means. I mean, I guess trying it's to just digest what everyone means. that got hired that doesn't work on a farm. I've never looked into that in my entire career. It's so interesting because there's like this paradox, right? Because what we're talking about is information that's an agrarian society, a farming society that we've now moved out of, but at the same time, heavily reliant on. Like farmers are really good at what they do. Like think about it. They're really good. The yield that they get off the land, the yield that they get off the animals that they feed, really good at what they do. But here we are in a new environment where a technological revolution, a industrial revolution, and those things are good and great, but we're still studying non-farm payrolls. Like what? What, what are we going to do about non-farm payrolls when in, it, it, and I'm it, it just feels- saying, like in a hundred years, it's probably, I mean, they already have mechanical tractors that people sit in an office and drive in the field. I've watched videos of it. People Correct. can plant and use- crops and harvest crops from an air conditioned office. Kevin plays the farm simulator thing. You can do that in real life now. Yeah, you can use the instruments that you need to use to, to care for the harvest. All of right? that. You can Fertil- use drones. Yeah, you think you can, they're out there like spraying said, fertilizer? Can... No, they fly drones over the property now. That's the most leading edge technology, but it's there. And all we've known since the history of farming is that Imagine we keep getting better at it. Gatherers. And that's why I really struggle with the whole concept of that we're going to somehow, because the population of the world is increasing, that we can't do that because of 
Are you kidding me? All we keep doing year after year after yeah, year is increase say your efficiency the yield. with production. We talk about climate change and global warming. Do we understand what happens when warming happens? If it's happening, what does it actually do? It increases more farmland because there's more accessible areas to grow vegetation, which feeds more people. I don't know. It's almost as if God created the world to be inhabited is the way I would describe it. It's almost, so almost. we got off on a tangent there. <laughs> yes. It's very interesting how the environmental system was meant to support So we say uh, all that just to prove our point that price is all that matters. That was a 15-minute yeah. circle that basically we're just saying you should be a trend follower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, Thank so you if you us. haven't turned it off um, right now, you're a trooper. Yeah, we appreciate it. Now- can I be a heretic and say, we are focused on the long term, but let's go ahead and play that game. Let's play the near term, short term. What are some potential important levels for me? Like, for example, March 7th, there was a gap up in price on the S&P 500 around 5150. That's an important level. We're into that. We're heading kind of into that area now. Can we clear it? If we clear it, great. That probably means more near term upside. If we don't, that probably means there's more supply than demand and we continue to correct into the coming months. Again, which doesn't negate the long-term trend. It's just saying, where are we in the near term? Are there any things that you're looking at, Ian, that are like that from a uh, near-term so evidence? The gap from long -term, we, February 22nd, which S&P cash is 50-40. I could go up to 50-60. As long as we're above that range, and that's pretty short-term. We were talking about this before. It kind of almost feels like a Halloween 2023 where, you know, I'm not going to say this is as dramatic of a fail breakdown, but I think you still like, even though we rally 28%, I think you've got a lot of people on the edge of their seat ready to hold the trigger on betting against the market. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what you one see today where you get, and that's, and that you goes get these surprises and every index gapping up over 1%. Again, what is supposed to be bad economic data. I mean, we're back to where we were two, three weeks ago. I mean, we've taken out the April 29th highs. I guess it's not bad from a price perspective. Now we've got four more hours right. to see if this holds, but, and Russell, you look at the Russell 2000, we're not out of the woods, but we're above 2000, we're above 2020. Those aren't years. Those are, yeah. Yep. I mean, it's, I, I, get, I get what exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So we have some near-term levels. They're appropriate to look at. They don't necessarily move the needle as far as positioning goes. They're just informative mile markers on a longer journey. That longer journey being an uptrend that we're on with normal volatility. And one of the things we highlighted in the past is how indexes are made up such as S&P 500 being a cap-weighted index with one of the more larger cap Apple, yeah. capitalized names being Apple. And here we have Apple moving higher. You described it as being in the back pocket of the market, meaning like if that moves higher, it could carry the market. It could also be the opposite, like below 168, 169. That could be a real headwind for the market. But here we are on something like Apple, you know, sitting at 184 on one of the larger yeah. gaps that I can your clue, I would say so, hundred percent. And your clue here, I'm not saying to be long Apple. The fail breakdown, the fact that it never had below 168 was not a good deal for the broad market. It's not a good deal for the broad market. Apple below 168, and we were down there for about a week. And late April 25th fail breakdown. That's when you. Sh really should have started to be like, okay, I don't need to be long Apple. I'm not saying it's going going to rip higher, especially fail breakdowns in a bull market. Again, you have to err on this side that, hey, I'm wrong. This probably isn't going later. I'm not saying it pans out the very next day. But again, as we've seen, to me, Apple back above 168, 169 was like, hey, I don't need to be betting against this stock. Now we're back to right. 185. It is definitely and back above the 2021 highs. A, a tailwind to have a player 
like Apple on the floor, right? We use the example of of Giannis and the Bucks, and Giannis wasn't able to get back on the floor. Yeah, how many games did and he miss? I, I only saw playoffs. a headline where him and someone else missed. So Dame, I believe, played games one and two, maybe three, and then didn't play until last night. Giannis didn't and play the whole was series. Was it legit? Okay. Oh, I think so. Yeah. The end of the season, he had a game where he went down where it kind of looked like Achilles. And so I'm actually still nervous about that. I don't know how that works. Is he going to have offseason surgery? It goes at a partial tear. It's impressive the amount of Achilles injuries that have been happening so lately. His brother still on the team. But anyway, he is. He's the hype man. He did show up in one of the games and had like three or four blocks in a row, which was awesome to watch. You know, the game before last that extended the series for the Bucks. it was fun to watch guys that weren't Damon Giannis, like just completely grind it out and lay it all on the line. They just ran out of gas. I mean, you didn't have your two best guys, Damon Giannis, to win. It's kind of like a market. If you don't have Apple and Microsoft or you don't have NVIDIA and, and Amazon or NVIDIA and Google, like that's a little bit of a problem. And right now, that's not the case. Google has cleared highs. Okay, I want to ask you for an update on one of your favorite analogies. So we talk about oh, okay. driving cars being the left-hand lane. What? Yeah. For context, this is Friday at noon Eastern. What lane are you in? I know what lane I'm in. What lane are you in right now? Are you still in left-hand lane, pedal to the metal? I will tail you until you move over. Like, where are you at? How are you driving on the interstate right now? Yeah. yeah, I'm driving like it's an uptrend. I'm driving with the pace of traffic. I'm also looking for this correction has a real high likelihood of being an opportunity. Meaning, you know, I'm I'm not looking necessarily to break the law. Like I'm not looking to go 120 on the highway. But this might be a real opportunity to take advantage of. Certainly not in the right hand so, lane. You're not worried about torrential downpour. I can't see out my windshield, right? Right. This is not a snowstorm. I know you don't get those by you. It's not a torrential downpour. This is, yeah, we got some construction signs and cones on the side of the road. It's okay to slow down just a little bit. But from a, a long term perspective, I like it. You know, I got the cruise control on. I'm good. How about you? Where are you at? I'm middle lane, but. Yeah, like I would say middle lane, but definitely I can see some cars coming up and we're going to have to uh, likely get back over in the left-hand lane. As any yeah. good American would do, they wouldn't just yeah, park it in the left somewhere. lane. You would use it to pass, then you get back in the middle and lane. I tell you, right yeah, lane. I mean the failed breakdowns, like not, I talked about this, on, like the failed breakdowns are starting to pile up. And again, mm -hmm. in an uptrend, look at Microsoft. I'll put Microsoft on the same list as a failed breakdown below 400, 398, 400. It's, yeah. just don't be surprised if David and I are, are on here mid-June and I don't know if broad indices are going to be there, but things like Microsoft, again, upward sloping 200 day. You could even see, a, I know we technically could have an island reversal what? on Meta, that's a negative, but you could also see a situation where gapping above 47 on Meta by Monday, and we got an, an island reversal the opposite way. And so your point is valid. Like the false breakdowns, actually, let me have you elaborate on that. You mentioned that the, the false breakdowns are accumulating or yeah. you're seeing a fair amount of them. You bring, up, you bring up Microsoft as an example, which is a great example. So you're seeing this and I, broadly. Yeah, and I would Is even say correct? like globally. Okay. I think Europe's held up. I mean, that is, you know, I'm down to show Europe some love. We've shown you Europe using, some love before. It's never. Are you using IEV when you're looking at that? What are you using when you're so looking I at So I usually Europe? look at VGK. And then there's been pockets, you know, and again, we. We actually switched lists this week on the team so everyone's got a new list for the month to cover but when you go through now china's been a big part of this but there's other places like argentina i mean there yeah. are pieces there whoever had i had currencies last month going back to your, your yeah. false breakdown point like when you consider long term 
rising 200-day moving average. So the upward trend is intact long term. And now you're seeing a false breakdown. What he's describing is that in the near term, we broke a price level that buyers had previously supported. They didn't. But then we recapture that level, which then also appears to be what's called yeah. a, like a stop run. When you break that level, you're testing how strong are the holders, how strong are the hodlers, how strong are the people and most that people give before. up and throw in the towel. Hey, it is what it is. It's supporting. And, but you're saying that that has shook out some weak hands and we're seeing things move higher yeah. using Microsoft for this example. This is carrying over to international markets. And when you look at something like IEV on an absolute basis, a representation of Europe, I mean, we're almost, we're borderline on the verge of trying to establish new all-time highs. Like we responded to the 56, 55 level back in April, early April. We're now back into the level. Can you imagine? Okay, how bad are things if we are, I shouldn't say all-time high, if we're reclaiming the highs that come from 2021? How, well, yeah, I mean, really that's that a big one. I mean, you've still got your fangs, F and G S, very close to new relative high. Like, how bad are things if Argentina is breaking out to new relative highs? What? They just got that Maleli guy, right? That's who are that's Mali or I know I'm butchering that. And I have a lot of Argentinian followers no, on it, Twitter, so I apologize. Yeah. That's the Trump version of And now you've got Argentina. Argentina. The market's telling you we'd rather own Argentinian stocks than American stocks. That'd be Which great. Which is awesome. Yeah, there's nothing better than differentiation. Like the S&P 500 has been the most dominant my index in the career. for, are we running on 14 years? Yeah, literally my- 14 years? Yeah, there's been pockets there, but like of where other things have probably done okay, but- and that's been my conversation with clients recently is market cycles tend to be on the outside standard deviation of our own professional experience. Here's what I mean. Most investors have experienced a falling rate, rising bond environment, or in the last 12 to 14 years, a US centric market where the S&P is in large, right? Large cap US stocks have been dominant. It glazes over our eyes. We forget that there's these other markets. And the other reason why we use technical analysis is it opens our eyes to when these situations are changing, even if it's outside of our generational paradigm, meaning we're seeing a rising rate environment upon us. We're seeing the likelihood, the evidence continue to stack up of a rising rate environment for the next 35 to 40 years. We're now just starting to see some international thing. I'm not saying the international uh, is in favor. I'm just saying you're starting to see that creep in. Same with commodities, that there are periods of time where these things do well. When you look at the 70s, the late 70s, commodities did really, really yeah. well. Is that a period we're heading into now? I have no idea, but it's why you use technical analysis because it's not always going to be the S&P 500. It's just not. At some point, and I can't tell you when, there's going to be opportunity. Multi-year opportunity the cost is, is if your opportunity cost is actually going to be if you're invested in the S&P 500 where you're going to actually pay the opportunity cost price for being indexed to the S&P 500 and not international, not small Well, cap, and then you think about like, of- I get it too, the utility, like if utilities are doing bad. Utilities outperformed from 03 to 08 substantially. Yeah. Energy, financials, small caps, international, 03 to 08, you would have paid the opportunity cost price if you had not been And again, I'm not saying that's happening now. Is there still work to do? If we're talking about multi-year o- trends, it would be like the first or second inning. And you've yeah. seen a lot of these areas hold Correct. up better like during the correction. I love that you brought this up. Yeah, you're saying the correction that's started since April from an S&P 500 standpoint. I understand things underneath the surface. There's corrective behavior there. But you're saying... There's some international areas that have really held up well during this brief counter trend move. Does that sustain? That's where we're at now. Like, oh, we pay attention. Now, does it continue? And if it doesn't, you've got I think we've got to assume but at least it we know continues. It. I mean, I like that's where to go back to the analogy, I might, you know, I've got a foot in the in the left lane. Like you've got to assume that the trend continues higher. Right. You're in a situation where we have the data. And so if you were to see a start of a change, 
this is potentially what it would look like. Is it going to take time? Absolutely. These multi-year, almost decade-long corrections on a relative basis of international stocks versus U.S., if they're going to turn around, you use the turning around an aircraft carrier, it's going to take time. And there will be bad overnight. weeks and bad months. But if you were to see the start of it, it kind of would look like this. It You're would start to look like this. You're truly attempting to... I mean, I'd rather see them dig out a bottom on a relative basis than a V bottom, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're just saying that. Yeah, like let's a, a put in a base. I'm not typical. saying V bottoms don't lead to great things and lasting things. But yeah, it goes back to, you know, I don't think you get 10 years of underperformance, 14 years of underperformance with a V bottom. I'd like to see them create a base over months and quarters, which is what we're getting. And then that leads to where like, yeah, I can now be involved in European stocks for like multiple quarters and years. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, this is still a, and we man, maybe, I don't know, maybe it goes on another 10 years. Maybe, maybe my, maybe my son is finding relative strength in emerging markets because that's how long it takes. Yeah, it could. We were closer to that relative strength being important and actionable now than we were yeah we've got we've got a long-term double bottom we're back to where we bottomed in september of 2022 with european stocks on a relative basis i mean we're we're creating correct it's just you just sit up and say oh wow that's interesting that that's developing that way it's kind of like when that quarterback quarterback makes a couple level two throws where you're like huh i haven't seen him make that throw before and they're starting to make that connection, things are starting to click. This is what it would look like if we're going to progress. Ian is saying internationally, it's not time to get over there and get super long. But if we're going to see a turning of that aircraft carrier, this is the beginning phase of that potentially. So we're always paying attention. It's why we use technical analysis. We care less about Jerome or non-farm payrolls. Ian, with us kind of bumping up towards the end of our time, I do want to highlight the major supporter of this podcast, and that's the Adaptive Select ETF listed on the New York Stock Exchange under ticker ADPV. Adaptive Select helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Through proprietary identification methods, the Adaptive Select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same, Adaptive Select seeks to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more, including how to invest in ADPV by visiting ADPVETF.com or calling 1-833-880-5200. Investing always involves risk, including possible loss of principal. ADPV is distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. Sometimes when I provide that commercial, Ian, it's towards the end of our podcast. It doesn't have to be, but are there any other places you'd like to point our listeners yeah, I mean, before I they stick, give us an amazing rating and share there. this with their friends. I'm biased, but the old ADPV has held up very well this year, held up very well in April. And it's indicative of a and momentum there you go. I mean, momentum, momentum continues during- to thrive. ADPV, even through the correction, up 22% for the year. You've got the S&P is up like, what, seven? Maybe closer to eight now after today. Yeah, I, th- I think this, regardless of performance numbers, it just is indicative of momentum remains in this market. Whether you're invested with ADPV or not, it's indicative of, hey, yeah. that's interesting. Momentum and 2023 was not, right? 2023 was move. not a great year for momentum, right? We had the Big Mac 7 story. Now, obviously, come October, that kind of kickstarted everything, Halloween. Much more indicative of what we, Refer- of what we would expect in a healthy bull market. And so, well... Any type of returns are not indicative of future returns. It is worth noting that when we look across the spectrum of momentum funds, they're holding up well. That's a characteristic you like to see. It's kind of like that whole high beta versus low vol, growth versus value, small versus large. Now, small versus large, still to be determined. But when we look across momentum characteristics of the market, they've held up well during this counter trend move. And that's a that's a high quality characteristic to see that doesn't guarantee a future like that of continued momentum. This but doesn't certainly hurt does not. I mean, we run an ADPV very concentrated portfolio. So it's going to, 
likely feel the highest of highs and in corrections it's gonna it's gonna feel some some heat but given what we had in april held up extremely well and then especially compared to other momentum funds so with that anything else you want to highlight before we close this one down and no get it over other to than i certainly don't think you can be in the right hand lane ready to pull off and sit on the shoulder if anything i mean the trend is up you've got to air to the upside that's right most consolidations if it's an uptrend most consolidations will resolve in the direction of the uptrend i wouldn't say we're at resolution at this point i would just say that we don't get to be surprised by the past week of information we still have may june and the rest of summer to navigate it wouldn't surprise us to see a choppy sideways tight market after a plus 20% move October through March. And then we look at what the rest of the year looks like. And so it's about Bayesian statistics, right? We're taking the most recent information and applying it. Right now, the most recent information is we have pulled back in the market, but we've since rebounded, not all the way. We're not at all-time highs using something like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100. That's not where we're at. Further downside could be could be apparent. We'll find out. Again, it's one of those things we have to wait for. We don't get to just listen to CNBC and make a prediction. We have to wait for that information to come in for any adjustments that we need to make. But Ian, great to be on here again with you. You always do such a great job. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.